I'm Leila Saad, and my life is driven by one burning question. How can I become a good ancestor? How can I create a legacy of healing and liberation for those who are here in this lifetime and those who will come after I'm gone? In my pursuit to answer this question, I'm interviewing change makers and culture shapers who are also exploring that question for themselves in the way that they live and lead their life. It's my intention that these conversations will help you find your own answers to that question too. Welcome to Good Ancestor Podcast. Hi, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Good Ancestor Podcast. Today, I'm speaking with my friend, Celine Saman, who I'm really excited to be speaking with. She's doing some big, big work in the world um, of fashion activism, and I know she's going to bring a lot to this conversation. If you don't know about Celine, you definitely should. She is a modern ambassador of cultures, fostering communication across industry, policy, academia, and the broader citizen population. Her, re- her research focuses on circular design and communication, translating complex concepts and systems into approachable stories that resonate with a wide audience. Celine's work in sustainability has made her a recognized expert. Her nonprofit education initiative, Study Hall, is now an official partner of the United Nations, and it holds an annual summit at the UN headquarters in New York. We're going to be speaking about that today, too. As a writer, her work has been published in New York Magazine, The Cut, L, USA, and Vogue, as well as studied in universities. As a designer, she's been recognized and exhibited in museums around the world. She lives and works in New York, leading research on regenerative aesthetics within her company, Slow Factory. And today, I'm actually wearing a scarf that is from Slow Factory. This is a scarf that was gifted to me by Celine. Um, So (laughs) I'm very excited to be wearing it. Welcome to the show, Celine. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila. It looks so beautiful on you and how you styled it. Thank you. It matches with so many different things. It's so easy to mix it and match it with so many different pieces. And I know we're going to be speaking today about how we can use fashion in ways that are sustainable. And this scarf just screams that to me. Um, So (laughs) thank you for being here. Um, Thank you. We're going to start with our very first question, Celine, about ancestors. Who are some of the ancestors uh, living or transitioned, societal or familial, who've influenced you on your journey? This question yeah, gives me goosebumps, first of all, because of course, when I think of my ancestors, I think of my direct ancestors, my lineage, my family, my uh, grandfather who uh, passed last year, um, who's so present around me, my grandfather who passed, you know, when I was younger, who's lived in Palestine and who you know, who's also trailblazed in his own way. And both of them men are around me. I know when we think of ancestors, we think of women and, right. you know, but yeah. for me, they're men. So. Yeah. <laughs> my men. Um, but also, of course, all of the ancestors before me, my great grandmother, who's also very close to me. I'm very spiritual myself. So when we th- when we think of ancestors, I literally feel them surrounding me in the, in the physical, in this, in this, um, dimension oh. um so um so they've inspired me a lot my grandfather who passed last year was a um an architect but a self-made at seven years old he was taken out of school and he was uh, brought to the the construction field with his father and he was oh. expected to build roads at seven and he was such an intellectual he loved studying he loved uh, Jubran Khalil Jubran he loved Sufi uh, poetry. He loved, um, of course, Rumi and um, uh, Shams et Tabriz and all of these guys. And he was uh, an intellectual, so even at such a young age as seven. And for me, that's like the age of my daughter. So I cannot even imagine what he was going through. But the metaphor of for him to uh, his first work basically was to build roads and open roads. And I feel that I'm so lucky and so so grateful and so grateful of of him and of my ancestors for literally having paved the roads for for me you know Mm. and him physically like literally making roads and um 
that metaphor for me brings me to life when I'm when I'm sad, you know, when I'm like, what am I doing? What does this work? You know? Yeah. <laughs> so definitely him. But then of course there are lots of other um people, ancestors, uh some are living, some have recently passed, uh, that have inspired me deeply, greatly. My um education is Lebanese French, uh French because we were colonized by the French, it was a mandate, it was a peaceful mandate, but it came with its toll of uh, cultural erasure. And um, for that, I can thank them for Agnès Varda, who is like a filmmaker who passed last year, uh, a feminist woman herself, but as well as a storyteller, an elder, a beautiful elder, the way that she carried herself and everything. Um, and from also the French heritage, there's Eugène Ionesco, Milan Kundera, Jean Cocteau. Like these people uh, are all gay men, but um, <laughs> gay white men. But um, they've also, to me, inspired me in being uh, in, in magical re realism and understanding magical realism and understanding that um, art is life and we are art. And we are poetry and we are beauty and um, we are absurd and we are light, light beings. Um, Zaha Hadid, of course, um, uh, just like my grandfather, she's basically manifested her dreams in physical structures and in oh. intricate designs and bringing some of the, uh, some of her background as, you know, as an Arab woman, but beyond orientalism it's just like the way that she expressed herself was so beautiful Jocelyn Saab is a Lebanese filmmaker she was a core part of the of the war in Lebanon in terms of documenting it and documenting it with poetry and beauty Edward Said um, the father of post-colonialism theory brought me so much peace in reading him and understanding that we can speak of these things in ways that are grounded and in ways that are as intellectual, yeah. if not more intellectual. <laughs> and Octavia Butler, for all of her body of work, specifically around talking about climate, even though I don't know if that was her goal, but climate, race, spirituality, all these things that I embody in this life and um, and one last one, Karime Aboud, who was a Palestinian photographer who lived in Beirut, who just changed the game in terms of playful photography. Uh, she was very playful, very, um, it was in the documentary, like she was documenting, you know, the, the, the people who disappeared in terms of culture, in terms of richness in, in this region, but the way that she documented them was not like in serious faces like that. They, they were all like playful and um, had handstands and um, mm -hmm. just how she was doing it was filled with joy. And for me, that's something I, I am inspired by. Mm. <laughs> I love, thank you for sharing all of that. I love um, all those answers. You know, when you spoke about your grandfather and you said he, he, you know, he built roads and he, and he paved roads for, for me. And I thought, and that's what you do for the rest of us as well, Celine. Mm -hmm. you're, you're doing that in so many ways. Um, one of the things that I want to get into is you are noted as having coined the term fashion activism. <laughs> um, and so you are paving this road for us, bridging these two different things, which just a few years ago were probably quite far apart. Now mm -hmm. are yes, it's natural and we talk about it and it's normal, but even just a few years ago, we're quite far apart. Um, and so I see you doing that work. Um, I just want to acknowledge you for that. Thank and you. then Thank you. I love what you said about Edward Said and the way that he was able to talk about um, these things, like, and even some of the other ancestors that you spoke of, there's this kind of like, playful, artistic, free, imaginative energy that is paired with this really grounded, architected, um, you know, like frameworked, you know, conceptualism, they go together. And I see that so much in your work as well. Um, 
some of the things that we're going to talk about today, your work with Slow Factory, um, the study hall, you are constructing and, and facilitating and holding space for really important conversations, um, bringing together issues of fashion and sustainability, uh, climate, um, racial justice. And yet there is that imagination that's still there, that uh, 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 playfulness that is still there, that sense of creativity that is still there, and so it's um, it's really inspiring to to see. And also, I love you for saying Octavia Butler because I love anyone who will mention Audrey Lord and Octavia Butler. Oh yeah, Audrey Lord. I wanted to mention her as well for sure. Um, Audrey Lord. Just a note is that the vocabulary to discuss racial justice in America uh, is so ins inspiring for women coming from the Middle East because we don't have that vocabulary at all. I mean, of course, we learn so much from uh, black authors, black women authors. Yeah. Uh, to me, it's in the words, the words that were put together to describe the black experience in right. America, and how we can read that and understand, wow, hold on a second, like, we, you know, there's so much to learn here for, for any minority uh, under colonial, you know, under colonial power. Absolutely. Yeah, she was um, just incredible. From the first moment I started reading her words was just drawn in and have been ever since. And as you said, with, with Octavia Butler, um, when you were speaking about um, the three gay white men and you were saying about how they, you know, and I was like, oh, and Octavia Butler also. And then you said Octavia Butler and I was like, yes, <laughs> because she had these yeah. fantastical stories, which are really about, you know, they were about humanity, um, but they were also about, and I found so much inspiration about what to do when you are in situations and in uh, environments where basically the, it's a dystopia or you're really like the fate of the people is at stake and you're having to reimagine new worlds and what would they look like? What would the breakdown of the current world we're in look like? And what would the imagining of the new world look like? And in so many of her books, you can see that there are the people who are like, have accepted that this is where we need to go. These are the steps that we need to take. And they are at the forefront, but they are often alone. They are often misunderstood. Um, they are often having to take um, a lot of hits, but they do it because they know it's the only way, and they do it for the love of those who they want to be able to to lead through that way. And I see people like yourself again, who are at the forefront of this work. You know, in the fashion industry, it's hard to have these conversations, right, around sustainability. <laughs> Talk to me a little bit about what your journey has been like in that, because fashion is such an institution and, um, and you know, a long held institution and it was not built on the foundation of sustainability, it was not built on the foundation of um, the, uh, what is good for the, you, you talk about what is good for the people and good for the earth, right? I mean, I simplify a lot of things so yeah. that they, of course, I write very like deep things and theories and whatnot, but I yeah. also want to, my main goal is, is for it to be accessible. That's right. To be understood by the, by the general public. Like you don't need a master's to read my stuff and you don't need to dig deep into my weird uh, comparisons and whatnot, right. you know? <laughs> so for me, I'm a, a product of the, uh, of the world of outside the institution. Similarly to my grandfather, I'm a, I'm a self-made person. I, I, I'm an autodidact. I don't know if we say that in English. Autodidact. I don't know. Uh, but someone who studies on their own, who don't yeah. need an institution to learn. Um, and for that, I decided to build a sort of a, a, a an open institution where people can can take from from what I gathered and 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 learn from these things and come together to discuss a few things. Um, for the conversation of fashion and sustainability, it does not come with the understanding that, we, you know, all of this linear system that we live in, mm. this, this linear system of there is a product, I use it, I discard it, and it's gone into the oblivion, I don't even know where it goes. But this linear understanding of the world is also a mirror of the Western philosophies and the Western understanding of our world mm. it really begins with the idea of i i i think therefore i am the separation between mind and 
environment, mind and right. you know, society, mind and body, right. this, 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 this division. And uh, when you go back into the, uh, the Western uh, uh, understanding, the Western philosophies, um, and the beginning of this linear uh, understanding of our world, um, it's also the beginning of colonialism. It's right. also the beginning of justification of the colonial empire that was being built. It was at the top of that pyramid, there was the white man, the white understanding of the, of the world as the superior understanding, as they had figured out a way to justify said, said perception with science, even though it was erroneous. Uh, later on, they figured out with philosophy, even though later on, and we're still trying to dismantle that, they, they realize that it's, it's also erroneous, it's false. Right. Um, and so many other theories that they've built around uh, the white, uh, you know, Western philosophies was built around this um, erroneous understanding and linear understanding of I am born, I live, I die. And when you look at this linearity, this basically this is what we live in. This is the mirror. Yes of this understanding. This is how we create products. This is how we source products. This is how we source, we, we, we exploit resources from this planet. This is how we've built uh, this, our societies. Right. Um, and not our societies as the global South, but the Western society that is right. the dominant society that also has impacted global South, Eastern philosophies, indigenous philosophies, right. black philosophies, all of these others philosophies that when you look at them they are much closer to how nature functions they're much more scientific as well um, in terms of regeneration circularity these ideas of regeneration and circularity are understood in eastern philosophy these mm -hmm. are understood in uh, the just eastern philosophies first and then in indigenous philosophies as well of course in, in the way that Everything is regenerated. Everything is it, nothing. Li nothing is born. Nothing is dying. Everything is in that circle. Right. There is nothing that is born and nothing that dies. Right. We are, and it is in this circle. We still breathe the same air as the last uh, breath of this, the dinosaurs. Right. So everyone who has exhaled their last breath, it's still in this atmosphere. It's still on Earth. Right. Everything is still here. It's not, it doesn't go away. Right. It, does, it doesn't disappear. But for the Western philosophy and the Western eye, if I don't see it, it's not there. Unless I see it, it will be there. Right. Um, <clears throat> so we are living in this mirror of colonialism, or at least the philosophies that empowered colonialism and the philosophies that as well um, defined and justified uh, thousands of years of cultural erasure of um you know of 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 slavery of racism of all of these things that we fight you fight in your uh, fight and we fight as well in our fight and you know different uh, fields could be also pushing against that yes uh, but at the end of the day it is a um a philosophical understanding of what the world is what is this world right you know like what is right. this world how do you understand this world, why are you here? Right. Who are you as a human right. and so on? Yeah, because so what I'm hearing you say is it's not just about, um, I don't know, having a, it's, it is about this, but it's not just about having a sense of responsibility or having this, you know, recycle, reuse, like having these kind of things that we teach the children. It really goes to the core of how we understand that the, the world operates, the universe operates, right? And so as you were talking about circular and regenerative, and I was thinking about how, you know, there's that law that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it just gets transformed, right? Um, when you were speaking about how we still breathe the same air, everything is still the same. And yet you're absolutely right. We act like we are the creator of the thing. And then once it's gone, it's gone, just because we cannot see it. And to me, what that says then is that we don't place any value on anything that's in that line um, because we'll just then add a new thing and take it through the line and it, get, and it gets, you know, used and then we discard it again. 
Um, and then that to me reflects, we don't understand our value here, you know, and we don't understand the value of, of, of the planet. Um, and, and you can see that in the way that we treat the planet. Um, we, you can see us heading towards our own self-destruction. Destruction. I mean, two things I want to demystify. One of it is save the planet, save right. the earth. Let me just tell you that you're not going to save the earth. You're going to save humanity because right. if we disappear as like a nihilist uh, philosophy, which I don't abide by and I don't believe in, and I value every single human life on this planet. But if we don't exist, the planet is fine. The planet right. actually will regenerate itself once we are going to be extinct because what we don't realize is humanity is, ex is, is on the verge of extinction. Right. When the United Nations sends a report out and says we have 10 years before we have um, unrepairable damage on this planet, unrepairable changes that are going to be swallowing, you know, civilizations. Right. Um, under the, the rise of the water, the, the, the hurricanes, the, 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 the earthquakes, right. um, you know, all of these things. Um, and again, I value every every life on this planet, specifically indigenous black brown lives on this planet. And I just want to say that like when we think of uh, save the earth, save the planet, we are wrong in saying that mm. because that's not who we are saving. We need to save our humanity first. Right. And the other thing that I want to say as well is like when we talk about in, um, environmental racism, the environment is not racist. What, who is racist is our humanity. Right. Because when, of course, the hurricanes are hitting you know, uh, the global South, it's not that the environment is fucking racist, sorry for right. my language, it's okay. and they're hitting brown, black and brown people first because they don't matter. Right. It's, how, it's, it's our response right. to it. Right. It's our response to it. And it's the fact that we're still debating whether or not climate change or climate chaos or climate crisis or the apocalypse, <laughs> whatever for some people, is coming for us not the apocalypse because that's a very loaded term but like at least climate crisis it's coming for us it's like it's scientifically proven of course science is again up for debate and specifically in like social studies but like <laughs> i mean we are still debating though we're still debating whether or not this is real right and so uh when and when we name the hurricanes with human names and also white names right <laughs> let's just put it that way <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I mean, this is problematic. Like, right. do we understand what we're doing here right. and how we are completely uh, de-responsibilizing ourselves from this phenomena right. and how we are responding to it as racist? It's not the environmental racism that's racist, you know? And so right. sometimes that term, it gets, or, or, or ecocide. It's just like, what are right. you talking about? Because it, as you're right, it gives the impression that the earth the world environment yeah. is doing something which erases what is actually going on. The fact that there are systems of oppression, the fact that most of this is quite intentional um, and that the people who are going to be hit the hardest are black, brown and indigenous people. And the people who will be the last to survive are those who are white and who hold other privileges. Um, and that's not, and that's not the earth attacking us. It's the, mm -hmm. it's, you know, it's not the earth taking vengeance on us because we see that a lot as well. Those kind of like, well, the earth is like, we're just responding to what humanity is doing, but, but it's, it's responding to what those who are in positions of privilege are doing. And those who are being affected are those who don't have privilege. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. But, um, so that's some really great points. So I want to talk a little bit about, first of all, your story, Celine, um, mm. you know, how you, you're, you're, you're Lebanese, you're in mm -hmm. uh, America, in North America. Yeah. Um, I know that a lot of your history informs your why, your purpose in this work. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about your story? Yes, uh, briefly. <laughs> um, I was born in a war that divided my country, divided it by religion, by uh, segregated um, a lot of the, the, the people in the country and so on and so forth. And I was born in that time, uh, 1982. And um, it was just after the French mandate. It was just after this very heavy, um, 
I would say, invisible cultural erasure where our education system had become French, our uh, philosophies, our, the way that we understood the world had become more French, uh, this detachment between, uh, like I said, the, this philosophical detachment between um, uh, humans and nature yeah. uh, was starting to happen um, at that time. Uh, a lot of our ancestors fought back against that, but a lot of the new generation that was born in it, which are my parents, were very much assimilated in that new way of thinking and doing and so on and so forth. So I was born in that time and during a war that was extremely devastating. And that's why my name is Celine. It's a French name. Um, I justify it because I asked my mom, like, why the hell did you name me Celine? Why am I not Hala or Alia or Ruba or like something, you know? And then she's like, no, because we had to leave. And so, mm. you know, you had to have a passport name, you know, you had to have like a name that we, they knew exactly where they were going. They were going to, to the West. They were going right. to, you know, um, ask for a refugee uh, as asylum in Canada. Um, first, they tried the U.S. and then it didn't work, so they went to Canada. And Canada at the time was taking a lot of Christian Arabs, Christian Lebanese that came from the region. Um, and so we went there. And um, that's how I ended up there. Um, and to me, um, I remember a lot of this time, even though I was only four or five years old. And it has really like shaped me in a lot of ways, unfortunately. First, being born under the under a, a real war where the president at the time, the prime minister was murdered. And then he was like the voice of hope, you know, mm. Bashir Ismail at the time, especially for the Christian Lebanese. Now I know it's super loaded. I'm not going to go in there and I'm not, you know, I was born Christian Lebanese Maronite, but at the same time, I'm like not identifying a hundred percent with that. Although I understand the intricacies. I'm not going there. Yeah, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going there. Um, However, okay, so we, we escaped that war and uh, we arrived in Canada and I also spoke Lebanese Arabic for, for mainly, of course, a little bit of French word, but mostly Arabic. So I had to learn French and quick because my mom also wanted me to go to school. So there was all this uh, stuff happening with um, our papers. The date of birth were not written on it and so on and so forth, like a lot of mess yeah, right. of uh, refugee life and then eventually I end up in a school um of course I'm teased of course I I, I experience racism in my own experience I experience uh, uh being an other person and I experience as well uh, being excluded and also uh you know it's very violent as well you know yeah. this environment like physically violent and so on and so forth and I don't have the understanding nor the words to talk about it and then I lived uh, in Montreal for nine years. And then the war ended in Lebanon. And then my parents realized, like, first of all, they always knew, but they were like, we don't belong here. We were here just for a little bit. We mm. need to go back to where we belong. And then they left. And I come back to Lebanon at age 13. Um, and I'm super assimilated in the Canadian Western mentality. I, um, I think of my country as a, a shithole. Right. Um, first of all, it was like, it was post-war, super apocalyptic. Like there was, it was really intense. And then I get there and I'm like, oh, what the fuck is this? How, right. how dare I'm, they? I'm Canadian. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm going to write a book that they stole me into the Middle East and I'm right. threatening them that I'm going to do that. And I'm going to call Canadian authorities on them. <laughs> so dramatic. And my parents are like, shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> don't understand. So anyway, uh, at first I was extremely sad to be back in the in Lebanon. I, I was also other there. I was called um all sorts of names like um uh a traitor, you know, from oh. the from those who left during the war. Um you know, also, I'm not Lebanese anymore because my Arabic is broken as fuck and I don't understand what happened. And I'm like, everybody is equal and like we should love everyone. And like all these like assimilated um, stories that that was told to me in Canada. And at the end of the day, it was the most amazing experience because I am so grateful to my parents for having brought me back to the Middle East yeah. because. I, I, I mean, that's, that's all I have is that perspective and that experience. 
And that's what, you know, enlightened me in my work and um, being closer to my grandpa. And, you know, my grandpa at the time, he was already, he had done already his, he has an, he was an architect. He had built the house. We, the building we were all living in because he had like a floor for each of his kids mm. and grandkids. <laughs> and um, on the roof, he had his um, uh, art studio. Wow. He's an artist. Yeah. And he was reviving uh, Phoenician alphabets. He was reviving Phoenician understanding. He was mapping the Quran, the Torah, and the Bible together wow. in the stories. And he was like, it's all the same shit. <laughs> and then um, it's all the same. This guy, he's right here and like mapping it out. And my, yeah. my grandma was like, he's gone crazy. He's just crazy. <laughs> he's senile. He's literally senile. And I was like, no, this is gold. This is amazing. Mm. Um, a lot of art and a lot of sculpture he was doing was in celebration of his indigenous roots, you know, his indigenousness. Um, we don't talk about that because it's like 2,000 years of colonial history, whether French was the last one, but then before that there were thousands of empires who came to Lebanon and who um, who took over Lebanon and the culture. And, um, and so my grandfather was a lot that voice, that indigenous voice that I never heard before. And I was like, really? Mm. And of course, his kids were like, right. We're clearly Arab. Right. And then he's like, no, we're not. And then all of these things, which are a big debate in my country, actually, um, in terms of identity, it's a big question mark. Of how, what are we? What are we? Because right now, you know, some people say we're Arab, some people we, we're not Arab, and so on and so forth. And my grandpa um, was deep in that mm. research and mm. um, and also Aramaic and understanding those languages. And um, he was just so brilliant, like very much looking into uh, the roots of things, you know? It sounds and like he had a huge impact on how you see the world and how you see yourself and how you see yourself in the world. Um, is that And my grandma also on my dad's side, who was not an intellectual, but who was more of a oral uh, yes. tradition and my, you know, and who would, um, the way that she would take care of things. Yeah. Going back to sustainability, the way she would wash things, what she would use to wash things, what she would do with things, how she would mend them. How, like, of course, anyone could argue that their grandmothers were their first teachers to sustainability because it was an other culture at the time, yes. like, like, a whole other perception. So yeah. people can relate to that, whatever the religion or country of origin, right? Yeah. Um, but she was also very much interested in our ancestry. Mm. So it mm. sounds like that background and having, like you said, I'm so glad my parents ended up taking us back because it laid this framework that you, because at that age, you were already getting a foundation laid in your understanding that was very Western centric from Canada. And even mm -hmm. from, and, my with, parents were like, no. and even, right. And even from, like you said, the sort of um, the French um, uh, sort of erasure of the indigenous culture in your country, right? So you, mm -hmm. that was already starting to build and then you had this gift of these mm -hmm. an living ancestors at that time who were like, this is what we should be looking at. This is what is mm -hmm. important. Um, I can see that makes so much sense to me now on why you are, you have this energy of being a young elder um, mm -hmm. because you are, you are young and yet you are, you are, the way that I see you is, you see, you are like a ward of the earth. Like you're like, we need to take care of the earth and of each other. Um, mm -hmm. we, and you're bringing us um, back to the, that wisdom, mm -hmm. but in this very modern way. Um, because you're- But I do live in a city and I do yeah. live in an apartment. Yes. And I, yeah. I'm in, in a contradiction. Right, um, you're right. Yes. And you're and let's talk about that though, because I think sometimes a lot of times in any work, in any sort of movement work, um, social justice work, there's this thinking that you have to be perfect, that you have to do it all perfectly. Purism. Let's talk about purism for a let's second. Let's maybe it. quote Audre Lorde. Right. Let's maybe like bring bring some some of that wisdom here in that situation. Um 
let me just find you the exact quote that I want from Audrey. Yes, <laughs> do I'm it. writing a piece actually about the culture of austerity. Mm. Um, and it's about shame. Um, and she says, let me pull up this quote, but maybe while I put this, yeah, I well, can find it. Yeah, so, you know, as I was saying, there is this thinking that everything in your life now has to be a reflection of this. And if something is off or that if you are living in contradiction, that you should neither use your voice or speak up or that you should um, sort of hold a sense of shame. You're right. Hold a sense mm -hmm. of shame. Um, instead of seeing us as progressively moving towards um, pra the practice of it, right? I see that even within anti-racism, in the anti-racism um, work that I am doing that I, I often have to explain, like, you're not racist or not racist. You're not an anti-racist or not an anti-racist. You're someone who's trying to practice anti-racism as a practice and you will make mistakes and you will mess up and then you have to get up and then figure out what to do from there but you never reach a point of perfection you never reach a point of ticking all the box and living in this utopia of i am an anti-racist um and you can see that play out in so many different areas and i know it holds people back a lot from even taking any action yes you know, absolutely at all and so yeah did you find it <laughs> no <laughs> ah yes okay yeah. shaming is one of the deepest tools of imperialist white supremacist capitalist patriarchy because shame produces trauma and trauma often produces paralysis yeah. and when we talk about shaming oftentimes it's the byproduct of purism i am so pure this is what i do i'm a zero waste i purchase sustainable fashion only, all my beauty care line is sustainable, I never shop at Target, I never shop at H&M or Zara, I yeah. actually shame everyone who comes out of these stores. I was in white spaces where this was the conversation, I'm not going to lie to you, right. and in these white spaces where they were like, we are sustainable, and we're going to do something for sustainable fashion, and I, and I would be like, guys, like, no, I'm out, like, this is not how... This is not okay what you're thinking, what you're doing, your shaming tactics of wanting to shame people coming out of H&M. Like you have no idea what the fuck you're talking about. Mm. If you are able to purchase things from the real real and only the real real and only Stella McCartney and only the big privileged things, then, you know, you are out. You are part of the problem. Right. And that, and that speaks so much to privilege and access is right as well. Right. Mm -hmm. So, because what I hear you saying is a lot of the being able to access this space is where you can, you, you only use things which are completely sustainable, completely zero waste that there, there is a cost that comes with that. And, and so, but the shaming happens to those who don't have the privilege or the accessibility. Um, exactly. And again, another stat, the world's richest 10% produce half of carbon emissions, while the poorest 3.5 billion account for just a tenth. Right. So when we look at this stat, for instance, uh, affluent people, especially the global, in the global north, are responsible of, of over, you know, the majority of the carbon emission. Right. You know? So yeah. for instance. Like, let's look at this for, an, for a moment. If you are able to afford all these luxury products that are sustainable, you are unfortunately part of the problem. So no matter how much you can, you cannot buy yourself into the sustainable movement. I say that often. You yeah. cannot purchase your way into sustainability. Sustainability is an, a core philosophical understanding. And it's a very post-colonial understanding that if we continue as we've designed this, we are never going to be sustainable. This is not sustainable itself. The system itself isn't, you know? So where do people go from there? One of the things that I've seen you um, write about is that, and I know you get pushback on this, is that it's not about, um, not that it's not about, that although all of us can, as individuals could be taking actions, if change doesn't happen at scale, there will not be the change that's needed for for, for things to actually change. Can you, maybe you can word that better than I just said it. No, um. no, that's, that's totally right. And I will explain 
my, myself here and also I am writing a couple of pieces uh, this fall coming out that you know just talk more about this because you know the problem with Instagram is that you put something that's very simplistic at the end yes. of the day that everyone can kind of understand but there's depth behind it that yes. people don't want to read and they're just like ah, you, right. you know white vegans come at you and then you're like omg what's gonna happen so um just a little bit of a background though is that again going back to our system and i'm very much interested in redesigning the system and i'm a system designer before i got into this problem <laughs> or this issue um but when you trace all main resources that we use today in our supply chain whether it's food or fashion from cotton to chocolate to coffee to silks to wool, to labor. They mm. all trace identically back to colonial routes. Um, and they, they, uh, colonialism is not a thing of the past. It's an economic reality. It's, it's right. part of our present day. And I say this, and I, I've been quoted about saying this, and I've also wrote deeply about sustainability and colonialism. The system is the fact, is the reason why we are not, you know, sustainable now individual action in the face of a system that's already unsustainable already a linear big ass system that's exploiting the earth and spitting out toxic garbage daily if you are an in, it, like individual action needs to be looked at with your feet on the ground into in terms of understanding yes it feels good yeah. yes it's it it brings hope yes you feel like you're doing something but it should not make you feel like you are superior than your peers, superior than anyone else who is eating meat or who has a plastic bag outside the grocery store, who has bought water bottles or has, you know, uh, thrown into the garbage a pot of yogurt. Okay. Right. Like <laughs> you can't because even if you are the purest form of individual action, your impact is nothing, unfortunately. And I'm not saying this so that you go into apathy. I'm saying this so you understand that you need to remain humble in your actions. <laughs> and the impact that you want to do is pushing the companies, pushing the, in the industries together in coming at the center of this conversation. It's not an individualistic uh, conversation and again that's again part of the philosophies the western philosophies the individualism the idea that alone we are fine and we are gonna live you know it takes a fucking village you right. cannot think that because you're zero waste and if everybody we should sanction and police and impose that everyone goes vegan and everyone becomes zero waste and then we are going to be able to achieve the global goals or whatever that mentality is uh, an imperialistic mentality of policing and shaming. And it's the same root cause as what we're trying to fight. It's a community that we need to build, you know? This is so, oh, I'm like, my brain is like, because I'm like really hearing what you're saying. And um, there's, there's something that's just pushing on my brain there. That's, that's sort of a, a door opening of understanding of what I'm hearing you saying is yes, individual actions matter mm -hmm. and individual actions should not be used to shame other people who are not taking those actions as you. And it's really important for us all to remember the bigger picture here, which is that, we could get a mass group of individual actions, but if the system itself doesn't change, nothing changes. And so what is needed is a complete system overhaul, a return to the wisdom of indigenous wisdom that is not linear, that is pre-colonialism. Circular. Circular. Um, that we, that the, that the individual actions matter and yet and they are still within the linear system of colonialism so unless it changes at that level nothing changes so then mm -hmm. you know it's similar to what i what i hear in people doing at personal anti-racism practice if i'm just mm -hmm. one person making these changes what's the point if it's not going to dismantle change you know legal systems it's not going to make institutional change and my, I would love to hear your thoughts on that. My personal thoughts are it, it needs, systems are made by people. 
And so that we have to start where we have power and control Mm -hmm. and, and influence and be able to influence each other. But ultimately, unless the, the system itself, which is holding it all together is eventually breached, you know, Mm -hmm. things will continue to stay the same. Um, What are your thoughts on that? And where do you get a sense of, um, (laughs) I'm asking you this question, which I often get asked and I often roll my eyes when I get it, but I'm asking it to you now. (laughs) Where do you get a sense of hope? Like, where are you pointing? Where is the direction for you? Hope comes with action. So definitely keep, being the most amazing and indiv- like do your individual actions. I'm not saying don't do your individual actions, do your individual action, but it's the same as any religion will tell you do them, but be humble. Like any sort of spiritual awareness out there is the same. What I'm trying to say, I'm not a spiritual leader by any means, but like, I'm just trying to say that keep doing things. Of course, we all change the world together. Yes. There's a famous quote that's like, if you think you can't change the the world, try sleeping with a mosquito in the room and you see like if you can actually move the things. Absolutely, we can move the things. What I'm trying to say here and my response to purism is around shame. And I'm addressing shame. And I'm hoping that by addressing shame, it's not making you want to flip the table and do nothing because like you can't shame your neighbor. If you're doing this so you can feel better than anyone else, you're doing it for the wrong reasons, by the way. If you want to do something so you align with your values and you align with your mission, your personal existence on this planet, then you do what you have to do daily. Every day you do what you have to do. You do what you have to do. And when you can, you're going to speak up. Yeah. But it's not given that everyone should speak up. In fact, just before this call, I was on the phone with my dear friend, Aja Barber. I don't know if you know. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I love Aja. Yeah. Anyway, and we were discussing just this because I'm commissioning her to write a piece on individual action and uh, just debating the ideas because it's healthy to be like, wait, wait, are we like, what are we trying to say here? Um, And we were both uh, saying basically that um, what we are addressing with this is uh, the purism mentality and the shaming that results from this purism mentality. Right. Um, Individual action, uh, of course, mobilizes, of course, moves but when we say we've designed the system no we've not designed the system the system is the result of imperialist right. uh, you know structures we did not design this like no that's an illusion right and our people and the, the global south in particular never had anything to say or do in the system that is so important thank you for co- yes so yes. when people say we are destroying the planet we have to dissect who is the we we're we, referring to right right because it's not all of us who fit in the we Yes. Right? And when we don't fit in the we, um, it's important to understand that, all right, I didn't create this, but I'm going to do all that I can to dismantle it however I can. Yeah. In that same way, the purism and the shaming come from the people who are part of that we destroy right. the planet. Right. That's what we are addressing. And this right. is nuance. And it's not there to also counter shame because, again, I'm, I'm aware okay, what are you doing? You're counter shaming. And what does that do? And then we get broken. distracted and we get, then we get distracted yeah. from we actually get distracted. doing the work. Right. 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 And we're like, no, you're shaming me. No, right. you are shaming me. Meanwhile, right. a wave of trash is coming right. to swallow us both. Exactly. You know? <laughs> right. Just to put in context. Um, I, uh, again, for me, I, I, uh, try a lot to have balance between my spiritual uh, journey on this planet and then bringing me back to earth so many times, you know, being humble, uh, uh, being, being, you know, harassed online or criticized online or, you know, all of these things. I look at them not as good or bad for me personally. Uh, I look at them as, all right, how can I say this differently or how can I not to justify the haters online? Cause of course there are so right. <laughs> open, open forum out right. there. Open forum. Everyone's right. angry. Everyone got something to say and they right. got the guts to say it behind their screens. I totally understand right. that this is also not like, don't read all the comments, but can't help myself uh, from reading all the comments. <laughs> Even and on it, and it comes phones. with, yeah, but it comes with 
the territory of doing of being somebody who's doing new things that push against the status quo, right? And that's something that I've certainly had to accept for myself. Um, when you're doing things that are causing people to have to say, actually, the very foundation upon which we base our reality is wrong, <laughs> we need to start over. People don't like that. You know? <laughs> and so how have you, um, I guess, not how have you navigated that, but it's like what I see you doing is you're putting out, you know, these, you, you, you write these incredible pieces. Um, but you're also doing work through the study hall and the, uh, the li is it called the study hall and the library or are they one? I know it's so confusing. So at I first go, I wanted I to, to build the library. I love life. No, no, no. I love studying. So I want to go. <laughs> I know everyone's like, what, the, what are you doing? You do so much again, like the regular, um, uh, Western person, um, white Western person would say to me and to any person of color that is able to multitask the way we do, is like oh my gosh you do so much I'm so confused like what do you actually do I get that <laughs> a lot I, I, I just had lot. to read through I know exactly what you do <laughs> there's a lot but it's, no, it's for sure for yeah. sure but for the library at first I wanted to build a library and then at uh, the first conference was called study hall and then everyone mm. was starting to refer to the thing as study hall yeah so then I dropped the library because it was the legal name is the library study hall. That's our that's what I thought. Name. Right. <laughs> uh, that's how we registered it. Because yeah. my idea was like I want to build a library and so on and so forth. Now the conference series is called study hall, and it's the one that people refer to the most. Yeah. So, um, and it's uh, the you know, and and then there's Slow Factory, which is like my company. Yeah. So <laughs> tell us about both. tell us about both. Tell us about the study hall and Slow Factory. Yes. So if I were to dis to draw two Venn diagrams, I'm just looking through my notebook. I may have uh, that Venn diagram somewhere. Uh, if I were to draw two Venn diagram, I would definitely be drawing Slow Factory. I, I knew I had it. Slow yeah. Factory and Study Hall yeah. as two distinct Venn diagram. One is a non-for-profit, the, the Study Hall, mm. and one is a for-profit, which is an agency and a lab, which is Slow Factory. Yeah. And they intersect in the middle where we run these events it's called Study Hall, and um, they feed off of each other a lot. Mm. So Slow Factory produces these events. Study Hall is uh, a non-for-profit. Uh, we exist, like Study Hall exists, uh, from donations from brands the events are free open to the public and for me this is where my values are i'm not going to take money from citizens ever i'm never going to do that that's how i am i get criticized for taking money from corporations of course nothing is perfect you can equally criticize people taking money, money from, from citizens, citizens right because men citizens like no they shouldn't be paying for this at all in right, fact what, what you're trying to do what i see you doing and appreciate is you are um providing free education for anybody who can show up basically right but it's um, also broadcasted online on UNTV and on youtube amazing and it's, and it's also uh captioned right um so, so it's also for 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 deaf viewers right. they can read it and um but as well as this year we're going to have an interpreter in the room so that people watching live even though we have caption but caption live is always weird yes because it's like not exact yes. you know we have to go back to it yeah. so 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 for the viewers that are at home that want to like attend they can uh, catch up to what we're doing so you're providing this free education that is quite very accessible um, uh, at men multiple different levels. And um, you're also, what I love about it is the voices who are represented there are black, brown, indigenous voices, largely um, majority, um, who are often the voices who don't get to be heard and are, are, are as we said, often the most impacted. Um, it is so inspiring to me. It means a lot to me that you're providing that kind of space. Um, and it also is, you know, um, and this is, I feel like the, uh, w one of the threads that we're following throughout this conversation within white supremacy and within white superiority, there is this like feeling of uh, wisdom from black, brown, indigenous people is somehow less than or of lower quality 
or uh, doesn't work. Of lower importance. Of lower importance, doesn't work in the modern world that we live in, may have worked back when, but it doesn't work now. And really, you're blowing all those stereotypes out the water. Um, Am I? I don't know. I, I, I mean, you are by bringing, a lot of feathers to by be bringing, quite honest with yeah, you. Yeah, with, with the people who are showing up, you know, and being able to, you know, share their wisdom and their um, experiences and, you know, their intellectual um, labor. Contribution, um, yeah. There, exactly. And so what have been some of the, um, I guess, the, some of the big ways that you've seen the, these events have an impact in, in, in the world um, at m whatever level you want to talk about? And also, has it faced any pushback, criticisms, uh, people who are attached to white supremacy and white superiority, what kind of things do you come up against? Oh, I come up against a lot, a lot, and a lot of, thanks to your book, by the way, I have the vocabulary to discuss these things because before I was just angry. I was just mm -hmm. angry, literally. I had no idea why, and I felt oppressed, and I felt silenced, and those were the only words I knew how to express my, my anger. Yeah. But after I read your book, I first I examined myself and my culture, and a lot of the things I come from and it's not perfect and it's far from being perfect. Even if we can justify that, oh, but we've been colonized and whatnot, it's not an excuse for what we are today and so on and so forth. But also the vocabulary that came from reading your book ab about what I was getting in terms of pushbacks. Yeah. When I was, uh, when I was um, uh, you know, introducing these concepts in the beginning or bringing the people that I brought in. And I brought people and people of kind of, color, indigenous, black, brown people, not to, it wasn't a space for healing. It was a space for intellectual discourse. That's, that's right. That's also something that's, that's different right. from study hall. There are places of healing. Right. And I love them and I, I, they need to exist. Study hall is, is, can, yes, of course it's healing, but it's a place of intellectual discourse. And it's a, it's a place where, uh, uh, we argue that these philosophies, these um, uh, intellectual contributions are equal, if That's not right. superior. superior right. I'm going to go there. <laughs> just, but saying. Like, equal, just saying, like yeah. equal, and actually are where the real solutions yeah. are from. Right. Yeah. There are the real solutions. They are where inspiration comes from. They are. Um, the solutions. Honestly, yeah. it is a philosophical conversation. And the pushbacks, I was getting a lot of white fragility. I didn't know that this was a term, actually, until I read your book. And I was like, holy fuck, this is fragility. This is uh, this white tears almost. I don't know. You yeah. know, like when, yeah. you know, and a lot of pushback came from uh, Europe like the European vision of, uh, but we are uh, evolved. Like, un unfortunately, right. it was like a lot of peers in the space that were like, but wait, this is evolution. This is um, progress. Right. Under the guise of progress, right. there was so much to unpack. Right, right. Because even there are white uh, people that have contributed to the space. Um, an anthropologist comes to mind, Wade Davis, who have I've had the opportunity to hear in a lecture uh, in person. Wade Davis, white anthropologist. I know the two words together. It's like, yeah. Bye. Don't, don't, don't quote the white anthropologist. Okay. Celine, you just lost all credibility with me. But I quote him in white spaces mm. because they can people can relate and they, what he talks about is that he dismantles essentially colonialism and white culture for you know what backed people. by scientific right. Right. for white people but backed by science and also internalized uh, uh, imperialism and yes. also internalized colonialism like sorry people of color that are around me they also need the work like i'm sorry okay. like yeah. it's not true that we're like oh yeah we're the purest right. form of everything no i'm right. sorry no, no we've, we've all been we've all you know? been impacted we've all been affected i know for myself i take i am doing this big work in putting out this me and white supremacy work but a huge part of it is i look at me and white supremacy every day me and white supremacy me too how, for sure right how has it impacted me the way that i think about the world the way that i think about myself my own internalized anti-blackness um i think 
and this is my own personal philosophy, but I, I strongly believe that to do the outer, to hold space for the outer work for people with white privilege without doing just as much, if not more work on my own stuff is irresponsible. Um, and so I, you know, I hold both and, and, you know, what I've learned from so many teachers in this work is that we all have to heal. We all have to heal. Amen. Right? <laughs> because it's, I have, I have only five minutes left. I just yeah. saw a, a thing pinged me and I have to actually go to a meeting in another location. But That's all good. I can We're talk good. about this for hours. <laughs> and again, a month. Amongst women of color, we are very hard on each other. That's right. Uh, we police one another. That's, That's something right. we never talk about. And right. uh, I was just discussing. That's a whole Asha other Barber. conversation. That's a whole other convo. <laughs> but I was just like, just on these things. Yes, we have yeah. to learn. We have to heal. Yeah. Wade Davis. The book is called The Wayfinder. I recommend it because from the pers from a scientific perspective, he argues that indigenous knowledge and indigenous wisdom is superior to the Western philosophies coming from the 14th and 13th century. Yeah. And he argues that if we lose indigenous culture, we lose our humanity. I really recommend this wow. book. It's a very good I, book. I and really want to read it. I'm going to see if we have it. You, you should read it. Yeah. He is a, a spiritual man. Of course, he comes in a white body in this life, but like he he knows a lot and he's yeah. he's I, I i would recommend i know i'm putting my name on the line here but um <laughs> he has a lot of vocabulary for us also in in, in facing these white spaces yeah. and saying look like scientifically i like it's wrong what you're yeah. saying you know yeah. okay so i want to let you be able to go to your next appointment so we're gonna wrap okay okay up. um okay I really enjoyed this conversation thank you so much celine um, Thank our, you for having me. Absolutely. Our very last question, what does it mean to you to be a good ancestor? So for me, I do observe myself as a young elder and I prepare myself for if I do live longer, like for, you know, in my older age, you know, like letting myself age and letting my body age and observing that. So that's that as a young elder. What does it mean for me to be an ancestor is we won't get to see the fruit of this labor, unfortunately, perhaps, I mean, inshallah, but like, I don't know for real. But the idea is that we are planting seeds and it goes back to being humble in what you think you're doing in, the, in terms of impact because you won't see it, you know? You're just planting seeds. That's yeah. how I believe it. I love that so much. And I'm... <laughs> You know, just every time I have a conversation with any person on this podcast, I'm always left with something. I always feel stretched. I always feel nourished. I always feel grown. I'm always like, yes, this is why I'm doing this work because of people like you. Um, no. So thank you so much, Celine, for being here. For and sharing I do your this wisdom. work because of people like you, Leila. <laughs> you, you, your contribution to this work is so important. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my love. I'll speak to you soon. Thank you so much. I hope that this episode has helped you gain new insights and find deeper answers to what being a good ancestor means to you. We'd love to hear what some of your aha moments have been from this conversation. You can follow the podcast on Instagram at Good Ancestor Podcast and drop us a comment to let us know what some of your biggest takeaways have been. Thank you for listening and thank you for being a good ancestor.